Uh, welcome back to our study of Colossians. We just finished uh, giving an overview of Colossians chapter three, verses one through 17, which is uh, really almost a manual, not quite a manual, but it's kind of close to it, a manual of spiritual formation. It really is a, if you wanna know how to grow in Christ, this is a text to start from. And we provided a, a basic framework by looking at some of the foundational convictions, the anchors is the term that we've used to describe what's going on here. And I suggested to you that there were four of them. And one of them is that uh, spiritual formation is about our effort rooted in Christ's work. So he has finished everything that is necessary to obtain our our righteous status, our justification before God and, and our welcome into God's presence. And, and it's on the basis of this grace, which establishes a new relationship that we, in relationship with Jesus, united with him by faith, engage in effort so that we might grow. So our effort um, rooted in Christ's work. The second thing that we saw is that the, the pattern for this is about replacing old with new or replacing below behavior with above behavior. So there really is a sense in which there is a version of myself, if that's maybe the right way to put it, that apart from Christ is really not the kind of person that you would necessarily want to imitate. And there is a new version of myself, which isn't even like me, but it's Christ in me. So it's not just self-improvement, but it's actually like the old me has been has been killed, has been has died with Christ, and there's a new me. And this, this, uh, the Holy Spirit is mapping Christ's character into me. And so I'm replacing, this is what in practice I'm doing, I'm replacing the, the non-Christ in me, me, with the Christ in me, me. And of course, Paul gives us some language of old and new and, and, um, and below and above. The third thing that we saw was that this is something that we do as individuals in community. It's not an individual pursuit of perfection, but nor is it just a collective in which I, uh, you know, sort of... Um, merge into the mass as a whole. No, I'm I'm a person who will stand before God and have a personal relationship with the Lord, but it's not a private thing. It's it's a communal thing. And then the final thing was, and and I hope that this is something of a practical tool to think through, is that on the ground, what does this look like? This this looks like new habits of mind and thought, thinking new true thoughts, replacing toxic thoughts with gospel thoughts, and doing new good things, doing the kinds of things that make sense as emerging from the truth of the gospel that we're meditating on. And so meditation and obedience over time, that's actually the secret. There's really not a silver bullet. And a lot of times we want something more, like how can I find a new thing or a new relationship or a new practice? And when we look for some of those things, it's not always bad, but that's when we can get ourselves into trouble because we begin to remove ourselves from, from being centered on Christ and, and really what Christ calls us to is, to is to trust in him by thinking through the things he's revealed and doing the things that he calls us to do. At any rate, what I want to do right now is to dig deeper into this passage. I don't know if deeper is the right word, but, but to think about um, something that I didn't draw your attention to that maybe can help us reflect on how we can actually um, understand and replace our sin. So understand and replace our old mind habits with new body habits. We can set our minds and things above, be renewed in knowledge in the image of the creator and do the good things that are being talked about in here. And um, what I want you to first notice is that there's a little bit of a pattern in here when it comes to the lists that Paul is mentioning. So he mentions two lists of sins, and I think they have kind of the same sort of a structure. So in chapter five, he gives us what we'll call sins of desire. Not trying to be super technical, but that's a general heading. And he says, uh, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality. That's the word porneia. It refers to any form of, of sexual expression that, that transgresses God's boundaries for sexuality. And his boundaries for sexuality is designed for one man and one woman in, in the covenant relationship of marriage. And those aren't just random boundaries. That's how we protect what sex is designed to do, which is to display God's love for his people. And we talk all day about that. But porneia is a general term that, that really refers to any form of, of, of sexual expression expression that goes outside of that God-given, uh, worthy of celebration boundary. Uh, impurity is kind of what you would think it is. It's something that doesn't belong in the presence of God. Lust is, is, is a desire to, to, to own something that is mine, usually a person. It's often sexual in nature, but it can refer to other desires. Evil desires is a general term for evil desires. And then greed, I just want more and more and more. And then finally, he says, which is idolatry. So I want you to notice here, we have sins of desire and we have five plus one, sexual morality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is 
idolatry. So that's fascinating. We'll put an I there for idolatry. Then you move down a little bit and you've got a second list of sins. Later on in this passage, you have sins of anger. So he says, you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. I'm in verse seven, now verse eight, but you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, you know what anger is? Uh, being upset about not getting your way. Rage is when it turns into this red hot, fiery, um, I'm just gonna go off on somebody. Malice is planning to do evil against someone. Slander is speaking badly about people in order to, to bring down their name. Filthy language, that's a hard thing to translate. I tend to think of it as, as really a, abusive language. Filthy language is fine, terms that are inappropriate for God's people. I think with a, a real emphasis on terms that are designed to, to bring destruction to other people as opposed to terms designed to, just bring, li to, to, to bring life. You can look at Ephesians 4 as a parallel. Um, and then um, it says, don't lie to each other. So once more, you have five plus one, anger, rage, malice, slander, and abusive language, and then lying. So we're going to put an L in here for the one that sort of encapsulates it. I'll put an ID for idolatry, L-I for lie. So you have the sins of desire, sins of anger, five plus one. Isn't that interesting? Then I think what you have down below is another list, except now it's, you could call them virtues. We'll, we'll call them expressions. Expressions of love. So the sins of desire, the sins of anger, and the expressions of love. Here, I can't decide how I think it should be counted. I'll, I'll tell you, and then maybe you can help me decide. I used to think it was another five plus one, because Paul says in verse 12, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. There's five. And then he talks about bearing with each other and forgiving one another. And then he comes back in verse 14 and says, over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So I used to say there's another five plus one, and I would just leave out bearing with each other and forgiving each other. I wonder though, if it's actually seven plus one. So bear with me here, if you would. You have the five virtues, uh, compassion, which means the ability to, to put yourself in other people's shoes. Kindness means the willingness to help other people. That's what it's, it's actually a very practical term. It's not just about having sweet disposition. That's fine too, but it's about being willing to help people. Humility is, is a recognition of who I am and where I fit. Like I'm not a, I'm not a worm, but I'm not a God. I'm, I'm, I'm a human being. And so I'm not too good to take care of other people. I'm not too good for anyone. And so it's having a, a certain view of yourself that leads to, um, leads to a, a way of treating other people as your equals. Uh, not being below you. Gentleness is, of course, the opposite of harshness. And so it refers to, um, well, I mean, gentleness is sort of self-explanatory. It's you're not just always coming at people, you know. And then finally, um, what's the last one? Patience or long suffering or sticking with people over a long period of time. Then you have the two practices, bearing with, which means kind of like patience and action and forgiving, which is when somebody does you wrong. I wonder here if we see seven plus one, I kind of think we do. And actually love is the very thing that is in, um, is, is the final plus one in this case. So what would we be doing here? It's just a suggestion to you, but we do have two biblical numbers that represent completion. I wonder if what Paul is saying is this is a general picture of sin, the old self, the life from below, and this is a general picture of the new self in Christ, Christ in you, the person you were made to be, the life from above. Uh, what if what Paul is doing is he's actually giving us a guide to think through our concrete attempts to be a person who's following Jesus? I wanna suggest to you that um, maybe there's a model for how we might understand this. So this is something I've picked up from various teachers along the way. I don't even remember what I got from whom. But I wonder if we can maybe back our way into a fairly practical teaching that can help us begin to put this into practice. So I do think that there's an order to this, that sins of desire lead to sins of anger. I want to start with anger and I want to work our way back because anger is pretty standard feature of most people's lives. We're not all equally angry, but we all get angry. And anger happens when you have you, so here's you, and you want something. I don't know what you want, but I'll put a star. That represents whatever it is that you want. And there's something that stands in the way of you getting this. So there's a block to you getting whatever it is that you want. Maybe you want, you know, certain types of sexual experiences. Maybe you want a certain job. Maybe you want to get married. Maybe you don't want to get married. Maybe you want to make a lot of money. Maybe you want people to treat you with respect. Maybe uh, you want there to be enough time in the day to accomplish the tasks that you've been told to accomplish. Maybe you want a clean house, like anything, right? Like you get the point. You want something and something gets in the way of it. That's when anger occurs, you, you, when you don't get your way. Now, 
we can be angry in all sorts of directions. Sometimes we're angry at the thing that's gotten in our way. So maybe I want to, um, I want to get to my appointment on time, but there's a driver in front of me that's going really slow. I become angry at that person. It's a really frustrating thing. You know what I mean? And so this is where we can end up with rage and all sorts of things. We literally call it road rage. We don't always get angry at the thing that's standing in our way though. Sometimes we can't get angry at that thing. Maybe it's an inanimate object. Maybe it's a dead father. Maybe I'm mad at my dead father because of what he did or didn't do, but he's not here for me to get mad at. So I take it out on my friends or I take it out on my wife or I take it out on my children. Or maybe I'm mad at my wife, but I don't know how to express my anger at my wife. Or maybe a wife is mad at her husband. Maybe my wife is mad at me, but but she feels like if I say something, then he's just going to not hear it very well. And, and so a lot of times people take things out on their pets, right? And so you have this object over here. They didn't do anything to you, but you're really mad at them. Maybe, uh, maybe you're on your way to this appointment that you're trying to get to on time and your children were the reason why you're late, but your children aren't there for you to holler at. And so you're yelling at the other drivers. They're just driving. They're not doing anything wrong, but you're very angry at them. So I want to suggest to you that this is a decent model of, of what we're talking about, desire and anger. And so what Colossians actually does is it helps us think through these situations in which we find ourselves upset at someone or something because we didn't get our way. God included for the record. He very much can be an object of our anger and often is. So basically what I'm saying is we want things, sins of desire, not even the sins part yet necessarily. We want things and when we don't get things, we become angry. That's a very basic understanding of the way human psychology works. When you find yourself angry, if you take the time to think this through, you may be able to develop the ability to identify what the problem is and then make it right. Don't forget here, this is all within this basic framework of mind and body. So we're wanting to think true thoughts, which guides us to do good things, which reinforces the true thoughts and warms up our hearts so that we become a genuinely Christ-like person. A person who in different situations, what comes out of me when I live is actually the spirit of Jesus. Anyway, so let's talk through this. I think that um, that what this can help us do is to ask the right questions. When you find yourself angry, the first question you should ask is, is this a legitimate desire? Do I want something that I should want? Because sometimes we want things that we shouldn't want. Uh, maybe you want your, you know, your, your wife to be totally available to you all the time to do whatever it is that you want to do. Maybe that's an illegitimate desire. Maybe you want your children to, I keep doing family things, so I'll, I'll, I'll move beyond those. Maybe you want your children to always obey you. That's, an Ill, that's like not a legit desire that they're always going to do what you say. Maybe you want your husband to be the right combination of sensitive and willing to listen to you, but also helpful in terms of think, helping you think through things. And you actually want, maybe, want, maybe if you're really honest with yourself, you want him to be able to read your mind even when you can't read your mind. That's not a legitimate desire. Now beyond this, of course, Maybe, maybe you want people to treat you with respect. That's a legitimate desire. There's nothing wrong with that, right? Like maybe you want people in your community to follow the traffic laws. That's not an illegitimate desire. That's a perfectly fine thing to want. Maybe you want your students to do their homework. Maybe you want your patients to take their medicine. The point is that you first ask the question, is this a legitimate desire? And if it is a legitimate desire, then you're not talking about a sin situation necessarily. The question becomes, actually, let me flip it around. If it's an illegitimate desire, then, then the answer is you go and, and work with Jesus about that desire. Like I want something that I shouldn't want and I need you to help me not want it. How do you do that? Well, you think true thoughts and then you do good things and you've begun to solve the problem. If it's a legitimate desire, then it is sensible for you to become angry, but you have to ask yourself the question, am I appropriately angry? And that means, am I angry at the thing that's actually standing in the way of this legitimate desire? And am I angry to an appropriate degree? Because notice where it goes. Anger, and anger itself isn't, of course, a sin. I don't think that's what Paul's saying here. Uh, You actually have in Ephesians, he says, in your anger, do not sin. The point is that anger is the thing that can help you see whether or not sin is crouching at your doorstep and trying to control you. So you have to ask here, um, am I angry in the appropriate degree? Because if I'm raging, that's sinful. And if it's causing me to actually plot malice, and we don't think of it in those terms, but if it's causing me to think about ways that I can get even with people, that's sinful. If it's causing me to say negative things about them when they're not around or even when they are, and I'm just trying to bring them down a level, that's wrong. If I'm using this God-given thing, my mouth, to like lie to people or hurt people, that's wrong. And so I'm asking myself, am I appropriately angry? Am I angry at the actual thing that is standing in between me and them, me and what I want? And am I angry to an appropriate degree? If I am not, 
if I'm like way flying off the handle or I'm taking it out on the wrong thing, then I need to repent and stop. If I've identified the thing that is standing between myself and this legitimate desire, this can take me to the final question, was what would it, which is what, where does love lead me? So I'm now asking, and if I've actually thought this through, then I've taken the time to cool down a little bit and I can allow things like compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience to factor into the equation. So maybe I have an expectation that, um, I'll just use one of the ones I've already mentioned, that my children do what I say, and maybe it's a completely legitimate desire. I've told them multiple times, they understand the benefits of obedience and the consequences of disobedience, and they disobeyed me, and I'm angry, and I should be angry. I should be angry. And actually, the appropriate thing to do in this case is not to rage and fly up the handle, but it's also sometimes not to just ignore it. It's compassion. Kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. This means that I come to them and I have a conversation with them. And if you were to watch me, then you would see compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Not acting like it's not a big deal, right? Like not, not confronting the wrong things that are being done. Not, challenge, not like avoiding this challenging of them to do better. I might even not be smiling, believe it or not. But I'm coming at this situation with the Spirit of Christ and I'm doing the best I can based on what I know to engage this scenario with love. So I really do think that whereas I've created a little bit of a model for this that may go beyond in certain ways um, what Paul specifically says, I do think that it's the kind of thinking that he's encouraging us to engage in. When he says in this particular case, I want you to put to death the sins of your earthly nature, what belongs to your earthly nature, and he gives us a list of five sins of desire uh, defining the last one greed as idolatry. You just tend to actually want the things that only God should want everybody to do what you say. And whenever you actually give in to these things, then you become angry. And so your life becomes characterized by anger and rage and malice and slander and abusive language from your lips and ultimately lying. Like you don't even you care about respecting another person's humanity by telling them the truth. You're, you're going to lie to them. And he's saying, no, 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 no. You put those off and you replace those things with love, with compassion, with um, uh, kindness, with humility, with gentleness, with patience, bearing with each other because you're not perfect either, and forgiving those who have done you wrong. Now, we could talk a lot more about some of these things, but I hope that this is really just enough of, a, of, of maybe a suggestion for you to think through on your own, and if you're studying this as a group, to talk it through amongst yourselves. What are the things that you've been angry about most recently? Are those desires that are not being met legit? Uh, is your anger appropriate to the situation? And where would love lead you? Paul intends here to get practical with us and to give us a plan for understanding the nature of our sin and for overcoming it, for replacing it with that which is good. Uh, one last thing about Colossians 3 and then we'll move on. This is a passage that when I was growing up, my mother challenged me to memorize. And I've always been so grateful that she did. Colossians 3.17 was probably the main verse that she would quote at me. Even when I didn't like it, it shaped me. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That is the recipe for formation. So think through true thoughts, do good things, be mindful of the way that sin operates, and slowly make your way down the path of being formed into the image of Jesus.